Morning, everyone. We study through books of the Bible here at the Village Chapel. We have some extra copies. If you didn't bring one and you'd like one to follow along, raise your hand up real high. Someone would be glad to drop one off at your row or your aisle. We're studying in the book of Psalms, and we're doing selected Psalms. And this will be our last week in that series. We'll begin the book of Acts next week from the New Testament. Looking forward to that as we uh, launch another church, another campus over on the east side um, at 8.30. It'll be great to begin studying uh, the book of Acts, which talks about the birth of the church and the wildfire-like spread of the gospel around throughout the mighty Roman Empire. And uh, a great, great uh, book to study. Looking forward to that as well. But Psalm 41 for the day. And I'll remind you that these are songs of revelation and response, God revealing things about himself he wants us to know, as well uh, the people of God down through the ages and how they've responded to this God who reveals himself, this God who's gracious and eager to be known. Um, and, and so that's one of the things I just so enjoy about the book of Psalms. I've been mentioning this from time to time, but I don't think I've put it up on the screen before, but there are five books or anthologies within the Psalter. Um, and so, um, just so that you have it, those of you who are sort of Bible nerds and Bible geeks like I am, uh, you like to know these kinds of things. This is the uh, grouping of the five books, Psalms 1 through 41, and we'll finish uh, book one today. Uh, you've probably noticed if you've been here over time that we've been sort of bouncing around, skipping around. We haven't finished in terms of studying all 41 of those Psalms. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close out our study, this uh, season of studies of Psalms, with the last one in book one, which is uh, Psalm 41. Uh, book two is 42 to 72, book three, 73, 89. Uh, 90 and 106 make up book four, and then 107 and 150 make up book five. Each of these anthologies are books within a book. Um, these groupings of songs, ancient songs, are, like I say, some of them are... Uh, 3,000 or more years old. Each of these groupings, though, ends with a, a sort of a doxology. A doxology is a word that means a glory saying or a glory, glory speech, if you will. And so um, that's the case with the one that we'll study today. You'll see that it ends with a sort of exuberant uh, expression of praise and blessing to who God is. Um, we have, in this season, been mostly in book one. You may or may not remember that when we studied Psalm 1, it began with this uh, blessed is the sort of a, a declaration of blessing. And, and interestingly enough, it's like bookends. Psalm 41 begins the same way. And that's always interesting to note the literary device that the people who, who put these books together, um, what kinds of literary devices they use. Another one is uh, these doxologies at the end of the five uh, books. Um, they, they have this exuberant praise thing, this sort of outburst. And in this one in particular, uh, it ends with amen and amen. And some of you are familiar, more familiar with that from the New Testament when Jesus would say things like, verily, verily, I say unto you, or truly, truly, I say unto you. It's the same word, actually. Amen, verily, truly. Um, more modern slang versions of it would be, um, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Say it twice, you know. Or go on, go on. That's, you know, so people are giving their assent, their hearty amen, if you will, to something that has been said. And so we'll, we'll have a, that's right, at the end of Psalm 41. And, uh, and it's really great. And, and it, it, it sort of shows you that, you know, those of us who've been raised in the frozen chosen every now and then need to be kind of nudged a little bit to kind of wake up and, and, and take note of something that in their day and time, see, they didn't have, uh, they, did, they couldn't highlight something with a yellow marker. They couldn't go in and highlight it on their computer and push B for bold or I for italics or U for underline. So since they didn't have those devices, they used the devices that they had. They would say something twice if they really wanted you to get amen, amen, that's right. That's right, you know. Um, another device is chiasm. It's a device that um, theologians uh, have, have discovered along the way as they look at uh, the ancient uh, literature, especially these songs. There'll be a chiasm, which is basically uh, some kind of a, uh, a statement is made, and then, um, I, you know, in this particular case with Psalm 41, we'll see there's an A, B, C format to the statement that's made. And that's based on, in this particular case, its content. 
Um, and then it kind of reverses, so it goes A, B, C, and the middle section is C, and then it goes B and A. And the B and A sections kind of echo what was said in the first B, uh, A and B section. So I'll point that out as we go along, as we get through the text together um, so that you can kind of see these literary devices. That helped, by the way, uh, in ancient Israel, it helped them with memorizing. Um, we don't do a lot of memorizing. I forget things. I, I just go to the grocery store. I have to give myself a number. That's the way I do it. I, I, I know she wanted uh, four things. Okay, so I get in there, and it's, I knew it was butter and yogurt and uh, green pepper and uh, what was that fourth thing? You know, and then I invariably end up having to call Kim and say, what was that fourth thing? But, so it's good to have devices, and they had devices back then to help them memorize. Uh, Psalm 119, uh, which uh, Tommy read from earlier, um, each line of Psalm 119 begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and then it goes back, and since it's the longest chapter in the Bible, it cycles through that several times. It's a literary device so that people could remember uh, it better. They didn't have uh, the ability to just cut and paste. So here we go, Psalm 41. Uh, its superscription reads, To the choir master, a psalm of David. So a lot of these psalms in the first book, Psalm 1 through 41, are uh, attributed to or credited to David as the writer. He is actually credited with 73 of the 150 psalms. There are other writers. Solomon is credited with, with one or two. Moses is credited with one. There's a guy named Ethan the Ezraite that's credited with one of the, the ancient songs. Uh, the sons of Korah, Asaph, different people. So this one is a, a Psalm of David, and he gave it to the choir master, which means he, he kind of gives us a clue. He intended for it to be used by the people of God. Uh, so in public worship, this is a song that they might have used. And the A portion, A, B, C, B, A of the chiasm is blessed, verses 1 through 3, blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. The Lord protects him and keeps him alive. He's called blessed in the land. You do not give him up to the will of his enemies. It's as if he turns to God to say that. God, y Yahweh, you, you don't give up this one who considers the poor. You don't give him up to his enemies. Um, the Lord, this is Yahweh, again, his name, sustains him, this person that considers the poor, on his sickbed. In his illness, you, Yahweh, restore him, the one who considers the poor, to full health. So verses 1 through 3 form the A section. The B section is the prayer of verse 4. As for me, I said, O Yahweh, be gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. Here's King David confessing his sins before God and asking God to be gracious to him. I love this about our, uh, our God of the Bible, um, always so eager to be gracious uh, to us, more eager than most of us are to receive grace uh, or to receive his forgiveness. He, God's very eager to forgive you this morning. No matter what you've come in here dragging behind you, he is eager, he is ready, just waiting for your heart to turn toward him. Uh, in repentance and in faith believing. And so here, David, who certainly was a sinner, we know of some of his sins, certainly not all of them, but it's also a general enough confession of sin that we, thousands of years later, can still find ourselves going, oh yeah, I need that. See, if, if my sin is going to be dealt with, it's going to take God's grace. That's what verse 4 tells us. Be gracious to me. What is grace? It's this unmerited favor. It's, it's, it's given to the guilty and undeserving. It's not given to the people that have got it all figured out and everything shined up and have presented themselves perfectly before God. So if, if you're perfect here this morning, you do not need God's grace. If you are a sinner here this morning, I have such great news for you. The God of the Bible is so eager to be gracious and forgiving to you. Will you turn to him in repentance? and in faith believing. I hope you would. Verses 5 through 9 are the C section. The, you know, it's the lament. It's the part of his psalm where he'll, again, keep it somewhat broad and general as he gives it to the choir master. It could still be very applicable to the people in his own ancient time uh, around 1000 B.C., but as well, this is what's beautiful about the timeless truths of the Scripture, uh, very applicable to us as well. Verse uh, 5, my enemies say of, uh, say of me in malice, when will he die and his name perish? So David, who had many enemies, King Saul was an enemy of David's, 
his son Absalom was an enemy of his. Goliath was an enemy of his. The Philistines were enemies of his. They were myriad enemies of King David of Israel. And so he says to God that they have said about him, when will he die? When will his name perish? Verse 6, part of this, this lament or complaint to God. And when one comes to see me, he utters empty words while his heart gathers iniquity. When he goes out, he tells it abroad. It's, it's as if to say these, these enemies, they come to see me, they, and they, they utter these empty words. In other words, they're kind of like the southerner, the good southerner that to your face says one thing, but then behind your back, they'll say something else. I don't know if anyone's ever experienced that. We do live in the South, so somebody ought to have experienced that. I, I, loved, I lived in the Northeast for a while. Uh, I, was, I was raised in Washington, D.C. We lived in Philadelphia for a while. And in Philadelphia, they just tell you what they think. I mean, it's just, it's a city of brotherly love, they call it. I always call it the city brotherly shove. And, um, <laughs> but it was always, it was always great because you knew where you stood, you know what I mean? That was, that was the good part about it. But um, so his enemies come, when they come to see me, they're feigning like they care in some way. They enter empty words uh, uh, while his heart gathers iniquity at this enemy. This, he, he, his sin, his malice toward David was just growing in his heart. When he goes out, he tells it abroad. He, uh, all who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me. Verse 7, how many of you have not, I mean, every one of us has felt like that's going on. It's like, everybody's talking about, I can't believe they all, they all know, they all heard, you know, and, and that's exactly what's going, he says, they're all whispering, they're just, you know, getting together and talking about me, and, and they imagine the worst, it doesn't look good, you know, they're imagining the worst for him. Uh, poor guy, bless his heart, you know, that's what they say in the South when they mean, he's an idiot, um, or, or he got what he deserved, or whatever, that's what they say, right? Um, uh, and so, even my close friend, verse 9, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. That's interesting. So not only are his enemies against him, but even his close friends have turned their back on him. And they haven't just walked away from him, his close friends. They've actually lifted their heel against him as if to push that heel right into his face and, and kick him in some way. And this is fascinating too as a verse because Jesus in John chapter 13, attributes this very psalm and this very condition <clears throat> to someone who betrayed him, uh, Judas Iscariot, who was one of his friends who shared bread with him at the table at the Last Supper, and that's even how he identified when the disciples were going, who's the one that did it? That's the one that I dipped bread with. So very, very applicable, and here we find once again the psalms point forward to and find their fulfillment in Jesus. And in this particular case, part of the dark bit of Jesus' experience is fulfilled um, or, or was prophesied so many years ago in this ancient song. And David himself probably had someone that, that did this to him as well. Um, some, in David's case, some people turned their back on him because of David's own sin and his foolishness. Ahithophel was... Uh, Bathsheba's grandfather, but he was also David's closest advisor, one of his very close advisors. And when Absalom, uh, David's son, plotted to try and take the throne from David, Ahithophel went on Absalom's side. Was that a result of the fact that David had taken Ahithophel's granddaughter and arranged for um, uh, Uriah's death, his granddaughter's, Ahithophel's granddaughter's husband's death. I don't know. But he says, my close friend in whom I trusted ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. I've been so betrayed. Even though with David, he understands some of what's gone on in his lament is a product of what he prayed about in verse 4. What? His own sin. And in life, in my life and in your life, some of the consequences that I have to suffer, some of the stuff that we have to go through is a result of our own foolishness, direct result. Some of it is. Not all of it, though. We live in a broken world, a fallen world, and sometimes you and I are the collateral damage of someone else's sinfulness or selfishness. And so here he is uh, uh, lifting up his lament, his, his complaint to God. And then verse 10 is his prayer. That's the second B section. So we've gone A, B, C. Now we're going B. Verse 10, but you, O Lord, be gracious to me. You see how that parallels verse 4 so properly? 
You see how that would make it easy for someone to memorize this kind of a song? You, O Lord, be gracious to me. I need your grace, God. Raise me up that I may repay them. And I don't think this is so much vindictiveness as it is. He's looking for confirmation that his trust in God's grace in his life is what will um, vindicate him as opposed to him just being vindictive. And there's a real difference there. Um, David isn't perfect. He is a sinner. But when it comes to his belief and trust and hope in Yahweh, he wants Yahweh's good name to always be preserved. And he wants the enemies of Yahweh, those who are at odds with God and with God's purposes in the world, he wants the enemies of God's purposes to be defeated. And so he prays something like this in verse 10. Now verse 11, 12, and 13 are the second A section. So we're going in the chiasm. We're going back to that. By this I know that you delight in me. My enemy will not shout in triumph over me. In other words, God is protecting his people. God isn't allowing his people to be defeated. And so David is singing to the Lord, I know that you, Lord, are gracious to me. Um, and I know that you delight in me because my enemies aren't shouting in triumph over me. They aren't high-fiving around me saying, look at, we beat up that one that trusted in Yahweh, right? Verse 12, you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. That almost sounds like David is saying, I've been such a good little boy, that's why you've upheld me. But I don't think that's what he's saying. Integrity is a word that um, it springs from the same root as integer. A whole number is an integer, isn't it? And so in his um, heart being given to God, even though he was a sinner, even though he acknowledged his sin in verse 5, how is it possible that now he's, he's saying something about his integrity? I think this is really about the wholeness of his heart turned toward God in this prayer, in this moment, to trust that God would be gracious to him, just like verse 4 and verse 10 both cry out for God to be gracious to him. And so I think what he's saying is that as I trust in you, you uphold me. As my, as my faith in you is whole, as I, as I turn my whole heart toward you, you set me in your presence, and then there's that word I love so much from the book of Psalms, forever. You set me in your presence forever. It's a beautiful thing. Verse uh, 13, in some um, circles of, of biblical study. They think verse 13 is actually not a part of Psalm 41 and that these doxologies that end these five books of Psalms are really just separate tagged on doxologies. Is that true? Is that the case? I don't know. I'll just read it anyway, though I like it. It's nice. It says a beautiful thing it, because it kind of goes back to that A section that, that, that began verse 1. Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. That's verse 1. There's the blessing of God in verse 1 on the person who joins God in God's purposes, okay? Now here is that same word being used to bless the Lord. Blessed be the Yahweh, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. Truly, truly, that's right, that's right. Go, go, go. That's how this song ends. And I love that. That's just beautiful. What do we learn here? Well, a few things. First of all, um, I'll just give you three for the day, uh, three or four things. Um, first of all, the great news that Psalm 41 reminds us of is that the God of the Bible cares for the poor. Um, there are several different words in Hebrew. I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I, I know enough to be able to look things up. Um, there are many different words that are translated in English, poor. Um, this one is one of those words that has a little bit more than just financial poor attached to it. The idea, we, we tend to think poor people are people that don't have much money. Um, in this particular case, this word has a little bit more of a weak and vulnerable, poor, weak, and vulnerable. It could very well apply to people that don't have means to purchase food and, and to, to purchase clothing and that sort of thing. But it also could extend to those who are weak and vulnerable. And this is one of the great things about the God of the Bible. Um, he's, he's always for the weak and the vulnerable. Um, this is a beautiful thing about the Lord. In the day of trouble, he delivers him. I think that the him there at the end of verse 1 is actually um, a ref the referent of that, that pronoun is actually the person who's been, uh, who's joining God in, in, in God's purposes and God's work. 
uh, this person who's considering the poor. And the word considering is much more than just thinking about, yes, there are poor people. It's considering with the view toward compassionate action. Um, it's considering how can I help? How can I be of service? That's one of the things I do have to say I love about our church here at the Village Chapel. Um, I love the way that on uh, Second Saturdays of City Service, la the last time we did a couple weeks ago, 70-some people gathered together down the room down there, want to go out and in part do, do work for the local poor, weak, and vulnerable, the people that need it, uh, really need some help. And 72 people went out. One, a part of that was the Little League team that we're sponsoring in East Nashville. They came to join us. Isn't that awesome? They came to join us in going and helping back in their own neighborhood as well as around the rest of the city. That's just an amazing thing. I apologize. My ShamWow microphone is brand new, and it hasn't conformed to the image of my ear just yet. So if I keep doing that, please forgive me. I, if my wife is watching by way of the Internet right now, she's going, I can't believe he's saying that. And it, because, I, yeah, it's just bothering me, and so the, I keep tugging at it. Forgive me. Um, so the Lord, uh, Yahweh, David's God, that he has given his heart to, even though he's a sinner, he knows that God blesses those who are joining him in his kingdom purposes, taking care of the poor, the weak, and the vulnerable. Um, and that blessing doesn't remove suffering and pain. It doesn't remove enemies. Why? Because this, this song is filled with the realities of a broken world. He's lamenting his enemy. He's, lament, he's complaining about how they mock him and scoff him and talk about him and all that. He's crying out to God for help. So it, the, the Bible is not some sort of Pollyanna, you know, if I just believe in Jesus, then, you know, my house will clean itself and I'm going to get great grades on my next test. My car will be filled with gas. It's like the gas from the feeding of the 5,000. It just keeps multiplying. And I don't know how this happens, but it's just because I love Jesus, you know. Um, that's, not, that's not the reality that we live in. We live in a broken and a fallen world. And, and David is expressing all of that right here. But what he's saying is that God is mindful of, God is considering and aware of what's going on in the lives of people who have a weakness or who are poor or who are vulnerable in some way. And the great news I have for you this morning is that we can join. We can be people of verse 1. We can join God in his purposes. I love the way Tim sa Keller says it in Generous Justice. If a person has grasped the meaning of God's grace in his heart, he will do justice. If he doesn't live justly, then he may say with his lips that he is grateful for God's grace, but in his heart he's far from him. If he doesn't care about the poor, it reveals that at best he doesn't understand the grace that he has experienced. At worst, he's not really encountered the saving grace or the saving mercy of God. Grace should make you just. I agree with that. Um, I, I, I know a lot of you grew up in churches probably like the one I grew up. I grew up in a church for a season um, that we had a food closet in the lobby and people would put cans in it for the poor but nobody would ever take cans out of it and take it to the poor. We felt good putting cans in the little closet because we were kind of, oh, aren't we nice, you know? And yet nobody wanted to engage with, nobody wanted to be with, nobody wanted to go and actually, and so there's a real difference. And I think Tim's right. If we've really experienced God's grace, if we understand how guilty and undeserving we were, but yet how gracious God has been to us, it should motivate us not only to glorify him, to give thanks to him, to praise his name, uh, but to also go out and be his hands and his feet as well. Point two is that Psalm 41 reminds us not only is the God of the Bible um, aware of and cares for the weak, but he also is aware of and cares for the penitent and the prayerful, verses 4 and 10. And so David confesses his sin in verse 4, and then in verse 10 he just reminds, one more time he says to the Lord, uh, Lord, I need your help. Lord, I need your grace in my life. And listen, this is all. This is so true, so timeless of a truth. Um, you, you've been saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. That's true. But everything else that has happened is also by his grace. You just keep running to him for grace. And if you want his grace, all you need is nothing. All you need is need. So run to him. 
uh, when you run out of grace. Um, and even in the, I love this, the combination of the, the two prayers, the, one's a penitent and one is the prayer for help. I love this because that's me and that's you as well. And so no matter what you've done this morning, you come to him and pray verse 4. No matter what you've done. You, some of you is that you don't know what I've done. You're right, I, I don't, I, I can't know what you've done. But I've probably done it too or thought about it in multicolor fashion, trust me. Um, but the great news is he's more eager to be gracious to us than we could possibly imagine. His grace is that broad and that deep. Um, Ralph, Dale Ralph Davis says, God's not so strict as to be harsh when we tremble. He does not ridicule us for our fears. He never mocks us when we are fragile. Here's David, fragile in both cases. Fragile, one, because he knows he's guilty in verse 4, and in verse 10, because he knows he's needy. And, and he, he has ongoing need to continually be, have God be gracious to him and to continually be saved or lifted up by God. Is that you? Yeah, that's you, whether or not you know it or not. It didn't just happen that the minute you walked down the aisle at the, at the crusade or at the church service when they gave the altar call or whatever, everything just didn't, all of, the heavens didn't open up, the big light come down. I, if that happened for, for you, that's really great, but it probably didn't happen for you is my guess. Um, the, t the clock continues to tick, as Francis Schaeffer said, and we lift up the empty hands of faith, and we continue to need his grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And the great news that I have for you this morning is that he's eager to do all of that. Um, thirdly, Psalm 41 is great news uh, that the God of the Bible cares for the weak, the penitent, the prayerful, and the abused. Some of you are here this morning, likely as many people as are here, and you have been abused in some way. Um, some of you in pretty dark ways would be my guess, just by the sheer numbers. Uh, some of us in lesser dark ways, but nonetheless still painful ways. Uh, some of us have been uh, ab abused verbally as we grew up, and uh, for us, those tapes still roll around in our head. By the way, a tape, when I say that, that's a reference to an audio tape. Um, <laughs> For those of you under 40, it's this little device that was just kind of like in my head. It's kind of just, I, somebody says something to me, and what I hear is something that was recorded on a mo uh, sort of an archaic format of recording, and it's in my head, not literally, but figuratively. And I, somebody says this, but I hear this. And that's because of past pain in my life. Some of you are here this morning, and you have old tapes in your head, and you hear things, and you interpret things through the, the, the voice of that old tape in your head. And um, we can run to the Lord and pray that he will lift us out of that, that he will help us to be set free from that old tape so that we can live a, a whole life and a flourishing life in his presence. This is another thing that God has for us as the body of Christ, to do together, uh, to come together and to, to join him in his kingdom work. Uh, Jeremy Taylor was a 17th century um, divine, as they call him. He was, uh, uh, he was around during the, the uh, protectorate of Oliver Cromwell. Uh, he was called the uh, sort of the, the Shakespeare of the divine because of the, the eloquence of his poetic expressions and the way he would say things. I love the way he says this from uh, Rules and Exercises of Holy Living. Relieve and comfort all the persecuted and afflicted. Speak peace to troubled consciences. You know some troubled consciences at work, or in your school, in your neighborhood, maybe even in your own family. Could you speak, could the Lord use you to speak peace to them? Um, strengthen the weak, confirm the strong, instruct the ignorant, deliver the oppressed from him that spoileth him. Relieve the needy that has no helper. Bring us all by the waters of comfort and in the ways of righteousness to the kingdom of rest and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Go for it. Yeah. I love bringing the image of bringing people to the waters of comfort. I've said this before. Um, uh, religious people are notoriously well known as moral policemen hanging out, hand, handing out tickets all the time. Let's not be that. Let's be gospel paramedics carrying the broken to the needy and the needy to the help that they need or bringing it to them right where they're at, you know. Let's be gospel paramedics and do that, okay? Um, let's carry the thirsty to the waterside. Let's 
carry them to the place of, of the waters, the living waters of God's comfort. I love the way Taylor said all of that. Um, fourthly, and finally from Psalm 41, it's great news that the God of the Bible cares for the weak, the poor, the vulnerable, for the penitent and prayerful, for those who have had some kind of abuse, friends turned their back on you, uh, enemies scoffing and mocking you openly, uh, people wishing it was over for you, you know? I mean, here's a town, too, where people just thrive on comparison thinking in this town. They actually don't thrive. They actually, to their own demise, are, are, are trapped in, with, in, under the addiction, the oppressive addiction of comparison thinking. And so we think, I'm a better guitar player than that guy. I'm a better songwriter than she is. I'm a better money manager than that. I'm a better physician than that. And we have this sort of thing that makes us smug, or sometimes it makes us small because we think there's no way we could ever whatever, and so we don't even venture out. But comparison thinking is always a, 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 a losing uh, venture for us. The abused, though, those who abuse themselves even with that kind of comparison thinking, those who have been abused by others, uh, God is aware of and cares for those people. And fourthly, those who need assurance of God's love, verses 11 through 13. We see this on display as David um, cries out to God saying, here's how I know that you're delighting in me. Uh, my enemies don't triumph over me. They're not shouting. They're not high-fiving. They're not dancing around me as if it's over. Um, it's so poetic and visual. It's, it's really amazing. You've upheld me uh, because of my my wholeness, my, my in integrity. You've set me in your presence forever. And then, and then there's that blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. I love this. Uh, for those who need assurance of God's love, you might be here this morning and be in that category as well. As I thought about this, this uh, study today, I kept thinking, there are going to be weak and vulnerable people. There are going to be penitent people. There are going to be prayerful people. There's going to be people here that have been abused. And certainly there will be people who need assurance. Um, I love the, the, the book of 1 John, the epistle of uh, John, one of Jesus' closest friends and disciples, for its assurance. It just offers a truckload of assurance. So if you need assurance this morning, uh, Psalm 41 and 1 John, are, those are texts that you want to marinate in. And just allow God, through his word in Psalm 41 and in 1 John, to just remind you, of how much he loves you, and, and even that he doesn't love you because you've been a good little boy or a good little girl. That's not it. Be gracious to me is still true. We still need him to be gracious to us. We're guilty and undeserving. And so with David, we cry out, be gracious to us, right? And then the great news is that this God of the Bible, the God of the Old Testament, and the God of the New Testament, the God of the Old Testament, who's sometimes so maligned by people who say he's just an angry troll under the bridge, who's grumpy, and the New Testament God is all sweet and nice and saccharine, blah, blah, blah. No, it's the same God. Psalm 41 tells us it's the same God who, who, who John speaks about in 1 John. He wants to assure you. He wants to gather you up and assure you and comfort you and tell you that he does love you, but it's not because you, there's some worth or value in you. He just loves you because, who he, because of who he is. That's great news. Why? Because you're going to blow it. You're going to mess up. You're going to turn your back on him and run the other way and not be a good little boy or a good little girl anymore. You're going to doubt him. You're going to have fears. You're going to, you're going to go through times of conflict and suffering. And that's why it's great that he loves you. Why? Because of his heart of love. He sovereignly is gracious to you. And it doesn't have anything to do with what you've done or not done. He has set his love on you. And that's beautiful. That's one of the reasons with David we can say blessed be the Lord. We can exalt his name the most when we exult in him. Very subtle difference between exalting and exalting. We exalt his name by praising him. We exalt in him by delighting in his love for us. Just one letter makes a huge difference. But the Lord uh, here through David says, um, I know that you delight in me. I know that you exalt in me, your son, because I'm exalting, I'm delighting in who you are, God, my father. Um, and this is just a beautiful thing about Psalm 41. 
Um, you want some assurance of God's love? I love the way Lewis said it in uh, Problem of Pain. When pain is to be born, a little courage helps more than much knowledge. That's true. A little human sympathy more than much courage. That's true. And the least tincture of the love of God more than all. That's right. Um, if you've gone to the cross and gotten saved, go back to the cross and get loved now. Did Jesus die on the cross for your sins? Yes. Did he take the wrath of God in your place on the cross? Yes. But what drove him to the cross? His great love for you and for me, sinners though we are. So go back to the cross, visit that again, and see on display on the cross the most luminous example of God's grace, mercy, justice, and love. Love for you and love for me. To worship, as William Temple, former Archbishop of Canterbury said, to worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God. And some of you need to do that this morning, that last one. Some of you haven't opened your heart to receive the love of God. And maybe some of you need to do that this morning and to take William Temple's uh, uh, encouragement toward worship so that you see how much God does love you. And in worshiping him, just like David does at the end of Psalm 41, you open your heart to the love of God and to devote the will to the purposes of God. Let's join him. Let's be Psalm 41, one believers. Let's join him and be considerate of the poor, the weak, and the vulnerable. Let's do that. Let's join him in that. Let's run to him as penitents and, and confess our sins. Let's also bring to him our cares and concerns, verses 5 through 9, our laments, our complaints. All, bring that to him. He wants to hear from you. He wants you to turn to him in your need, not to turn to some other device. Turn to him. And then let's go to him in verse 10 and pray, pray, pray again that he would be gracious. And then it all wraps up with worship. I love the way it does uh, in Psalm 41. I love the way that, that book one closes the way it does. In 1674, another songwriter like David, <clears throat> only this guy, an Englishman, an Anglican poet and priest named Thomas Ken, he wrote a hymn with the last verse, that has become what many churches call the doxology. I bet you most of you know it. Um, it goes like this. Would you join me? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him. right that that's right let's pray thank you father for uh, book one of these ancient songs how wonderful for us to be able to study these and this one today just reminding us of your character your eagerness to be gracious to us your open door policy of hearing from us when we confess our sins when we run to you uh, with our problems, with our concerns, with all of the trials and tribulations that we suffer on this, in this broken world that we live in and with our own broken selves, our own inconsistencies, Lord, we can come to you. And because of your amazing heart of love toward us, we know we won't be turned away or turned out, but that you receive your sons and daughters. And with gladness of heart, the gladness of a father, you welcome us into your presence forever. Lord, we bless you. We praise you. We thank you for letting us be your people, your sons and daughters. We pray that you go with us now from this very place uh, as we go out into the world. Might we represent you well. Might we reflect your grace to others who are out in the cold and the dark and in the loneliness of trying to be their own God or trying to find um, God in something that is not God. Help us to live in such a way that others might... Um, either be surprised at who you are and the kind of God we believe in, or, Lord, more than that, that they would be drawn to see Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.